How would you like to grow your business the easy way, and in my humble opinion, the fun way, through speaking? Yes, you can literally speak your way to more business, and we can show you how. You know, when I started my coaching business 15 years ago, I struggled making only $900 in the first two years. Yeah, you heard that right. Less than $1,000 in two years. The problem? I was busy running around to networking events and handing out business cards, trying to help everyone, you know, everyone. Then I took the stage for the first time in my life and began speaking and teaching about the strategies I coached on. And when I really got my message dialed in, my business went literally from three figures a year (laughs) to seven figures. The secret I finally realized is that when you take the stage, you instantly become seen as the leading voice in your niche or industry. Today, we show entrepreneurs just like you and just like I was how to dominate your niche by becoming the leading voice, not just another expert. We run an incredible business mastermind speaker training program. It's called The Leading Voice. You guessed it. If you head over to leadingvoiceplatform.com slash podcast and grab my free roadmap, Eight Pillars to Profitable Speaking. This free roadmap outlines the exact eight secret weapons you need to truly become the leading voice in your niche. This is exclusively for my podcast listeners. You go to leadingvoiceplatform.com slash podcast and start speaking your way to more business. Welcome to the Driven Entrepreneur, where we sit down with visionaries, trailblazers, and entrepreneurs and discover why and how they do what they do. We'll get the backstory, plus plenty of life and business lessons along the way. Here's your host, Matt Browning. Broadcasting from the Leadership Academy Studios, aka my new basement. Welcome to the Driven Entrepreneur. Hey, you know, this is the go-to plan for coaches, authors, speakers, and entrepreneurs of all kinds to start, grow, and profit a business that you love. I'm your host, of course, always Matt Browning, and today we have a very special treat. We have someone who I've been uh, blessed to be getting to know over the last little while here. This last year, we've been um, sharing some interesting events together, business events, and I'm coming up ready to speak at a retreat he has upcoming in the Midwest, which is going to be absolutely incredible. We'll get into you know, the event business and and how speaking can grow your business and why you should attend events like this and more, all these great things about business builders. With my guest today, Pat Miller, 20 years in broadcast radio he has. He left the industry to launch a business consulting, small, uh, a business consulting small business owners. And while well, he's helping clients, of course, get a better understanding of their ideal customer, their branding and positioning, he realized that a lot of business owners are underserved and the biggest thing that Pat and I have talked about is how small business owners are lacking community, they're lacking support, they're lacking really what he calls the incubator for success. So he created something called the Small Business Incubator to address exactly that. Pat, welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? I'm great, Matt. Great to talk with you again. Thanks for having me on. Always, always phenomenal. I love your professional background there. If you're listening to this uh, and not seeing it, he's got vision posters and he's got his uh, sponsors in the back. Like You are just so... What do I even say? You are so professional and authentic all at the same time, but you just do everything so, so well. Did you grow up with that personality where you want like T's cross and I's dotted? Or is that a skill set you had to learn in business? That's a really good question. And if I think back on it, no, I don't think so. I mean, I was a B student, right? B, B plus kind of guy, A minus maybe in a good quarter. Me too. I'd be showing up in school. Yeah. It was like, not like... A perfectionist in any way. But when you get into the radio industry, you are competing. Every day you're competing and every day you're being judged. So maybe it just got beaten into me in the industry that every show had to be as good as you could make it. You had to be as professional as possible, uh, which has some pros and cons, but it probably was the radio industry that kind of helped me make sure that all the details were covered. Yeah, I can see that. I realized when I started speaking, I would speak to like small groups and with friends and people that knew me. And you find there's a lot of grace with your friends, family, people that already know you. But when a brand new stranger hears you for three and a half seconds and they're going to do one star or five stars, or they're going to cling to the station (laughs) or they're going to be a loyal listener, um, it's you only have that first chance, right? So you found that in radio. 
tell me about this this 20 years in radio because i know we've talked offline quite a bit but catch catch all our listeners up when you were young tell us a little bit about the story of getting into broadcast i always find that my friends that are in broadcast have these unique takes as to why they wanted to get into it in the first place and what did you find in broadcast that you really enjoyed and or what did you find that um eventually wasn't quite up your alley that's that's a lot of questions in one but start wherever you want (laughs) (laughs) i fell in love with talking in front of people and connecting people and i love playing music for others i love making people happy and a way that you can do that for a living is you know play people's favorite music and throw events that they enjoy and connect one another i didn't think about radio as a career until my high school speech teacher suggested it so i ended up going to illinois state university the harvard harvard of central illinois if you will uh in other words not a great school great way they had a they had a great radio program so i was there every single day learning everything that i could in the middle of college i already had a pro job i had a full-time job my senior year and i was just on a mission to be on the air and i was going to be a brand builder and radio host and that was going to be the career and then 22 lady 22 years later it turned out not to be the career And so you were always, I want to be in front of the microphone, not, or behind the microphone, I suppose, in radio, not in the booth. Interesting question, because I like being on the air. I love building radio stations and positioning uh, products and connecting with listeners. The strategy and the mousetrap of the whole business, boy, that's the stuff I really, really enjoyed. But I also like being on the air because it's kind of this dual personality thing. Like you like being the strategist, but you also like being the person on stage, similar to what you do with your business and your speaking career. There are two sides of your personality that kind of coexist. Do you find that I'm glad this came up um, because exactly, I feel the exact same way. And if I had to choose, I don't know that I could, meaning if I was never in front of the camera, if I was never behind the microphone, I don't know that the same parts of my personality would have a chance to come out, develop and, and find the joy in that. But I love producing, like I love producing other people. Do you, always enjoy like producing other people, helping other people strategize? Or is it again, it was more like the umbrella of the whole station, the overall strategy? I guess my question is, Pat, are you a big picture, the details guy? Or are you a details, 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 and then the big picture comes together? No, big picture. Details lead to big picture. I love the big picture. I love the concept of why are we here? Does this have meaning? Uh, Does a talent like you, are you taking your talent as far as you possibly can? I love have helping people understand where they're going and how far they can go and radio stations, how they can beat the other guy. I'm highly competitive, which is weird. People don't think that about me, but I'm highly competitive and I like to figure out how to win. And that goes down to when you help an individual, why are they different? How are they special? What are they passionate about? And then lift them up to find success and that's what kind of translated from the broadcast industry to helping small business owners especially solopreneurs because solopreneurs get to not have to get to pursue their passion and make a business out of it it's very similar between coaching a talent and coaching a solopreneur very similar to coaching a talent coaching a solopreneur you mentioned that you're competitive and i i also find that fascinating because you said most people are surprised and I would certainly be, but you strike me as that, I don't want to use some made up lame word, but you know, co-opetition, what, I, like you sound sure. like, you strike me as this guy who goes, okay, I want to compete. I want to win. But if I help you win, it doesn't mean I lose. Can you sort of explain that in the entrepreneur world? Because it is easy to think, Hey, if I have a chicken restaurant, you have a chicken restaurant, you know, customer's going to come to me or customer's going to go to you. But I know in your world and mine as well, um, I want to help you win. And then I don't know, I end up winning too. Like what's, what's your take on that? What's your perspective on that? Help us understand if we feel like if anyone's trapped in that either or world, how do you create that both and win scenario? Nailed it. It's all about co-opetition it. and it's all about abundance. It is all about abundance. There more are, well, there are enough stages and enough podcasts and enough sponsors and enough tickets to sell for you and I to both be successful. And if you and I collaborate, we'll both get better, right? You might be the fried chicken joint. I'm the baked chicken joint. Great. They're two different customers. And at the end of the day, especially for solopreneurs or scaling small business owners, people buy from who they know, like, and trust. They're not necessarily shopping on product. They're shopping on the person and how they position themselves. 
So I always like to help people understand how they're different, help them figure out exactly who they're targeting as a customer, and then super serve them. And real magic happens when people who might be in the same industry collaborate with one another because they have a shared language. They have a shared understanding of what success looks like. And, you know, this isn't Google and Microsoft battling it out. These are two guys working in their basements, building media empires. And if we help one another, good things happen. That, that's kind of how I look at it. Yes, this isn't exactly the business wars <laughs> uh, of all the different times. I love that. And <laughs> right. I don't like going to war. I, I, I really don't. Um, and I love, I love building someone up. I found that each entrepreneur, if you really, if you boiled it down, you'd find a gift or a talent and not just, Hey, I'm a speaker or I like coaching, but it's almost like this deep ingrained spiritual gift and, and, you know, fill in the blank with what you want. I found that of all the things that I can do and that I'm good at teaching and encouraging through teaching has to be my favorite. It's the thing that comes with the most ease. Um, you know, some people coach, some people inspire, some people motivate, some people transform. I, you know, I know you can do those things. I can do those things. What is your favorite, maybe spiritual gift in the, uh, in the entrepreneur space? Talents and gifts are tough because someone like you or someone like me or uh, someone that's listening to the show that is, uh, running a business or working at corporate right now, they are talented enough and gifted enough to do a whole bunch of things, but some of them might make them miserable. Some of them might not be fulfilling. Some of them might not be what gives them joy. So I always like to think about it. It's not what you can do. It's what are you on the planet to do? What do you get out of bed to do? What is your favorite part of your day? So to answer your question, I always like to push people to, if you could do anything, what would you do? What part of your job or company gives you the most joy? And then strip away strip away, strip away and get down to that one part. So for me, I like creating ideas. I like connecting the disconnected and I like helping people see how far they can go with their time and their talent. When we put them in the right box and we have them talk to the right people and we give them the encouragement and the support that they need, because for the most part, people do many to do too many things for many, too many people. And they don't go as far as they can because they're limited with um, how they look at what they do. If they have the courage to boil it down to why they're on the planet for exactly who they want to serve, the sky is the limit. And that's the stuff that gets me really excited is to help people realize that. So connecting the dots. As you said that, I thought, man, my I must be wrong. I think my superpower, the thing that I would love the most is probably email returning. I'm kidding. That's the worst <laughs> part of the day, but I still do it. <laughs> Pat. So you, and, and this, this is what brought you to this whole concept of creating the, the business, um, the idea incubator. Tell me about the genesis of this concept. I know the problem, one of the problems is solopreneurs, obviously in the name, we're solo. We're doing it alone. Um, we also might not be able to c- get connected to the right idea just because we're, as you said, alone in our basement. Was there a, a moment in time when you like woke up at 3 a.m. or in the shower, you said, this has to happen? Or is this kind of a slow drip over time, the idea began percolating in you? Talk to me about the genesis of the whole idea, the small business incubator. It was the pandemic. So I remember coming home, walking through the front door and seeing my wife's face. We've all seen that face on our spouse or partner before, the one where they're truly scared like oh. really scared. And I saw what was on TV. It was the day that the NBA canceled their season and Tom Hanks announced he got COVID. Everyone in America knew something had started. The pandemic had started and she was freaked out. Here come all the emails from our kids' school, from the local chambers of commerce, from all of the business organizations. Everything's on hold. Everyone froze. So I did what I do. I went on Zoom and I started bringing people together. The next day, we were doing an hourly Zoom and we did that every day for 90 days. I'm sorry, Pat. Hang on. Did you just say the next day? The next day. The next day. The next day. You didn't freeze. Hmm. How did you not freeze? I mean, you froze, but didn't freeze. Like you froze some other things you were doing, obviously. But how how did you not freeze? And you said, something is needed. I'm doing it now. That's an incredible skill set I don't want to miss. Well, I've never thought about that before, but I think that might come from broadcasting. Okay, when you work at, say, a country radio station, right? 
just there for entertainment. But a tornado comes in, everything stops, and you start serving the community. There's a community service element that runs through being a public broadcaster or a broadcaster for the public. And I think that might have been one of the things that led me to feeling responsible for the others that were in my network. I didn't feel like I knew more than them or that I had the answers, but I felt called to bring people together. So I went on Zoom the next day and I created the show that I called Small Business Rally Point. And the concept was, listen, we don't know what's going on. We don't know how long this is going to last, but you're going to get through it. I'm going to get through it and we're going to learn. So I started this daily show where we shared what were we hearing from others. Uh, I interviewed experts to get the latest information, and it was all about staying positive and connected. And I didn't know what was going to happen. There were no sponsors. There was no financial play, but it was my way to serve my audience and say, we're going to get through this together. So I started doing this every day, and we did it every day for about 90 days. And that's when someone said, hey, you've built a community here. It didn't even occur to me. We were just doing the show. And that's how the Idea Collective was born. Because if you go to where we're at right now, pretend the Idea Collective doesn't exist and you start a small business and you say, I want to build my business. What are your options? The first option is to go find a chamber of commerce or a networking opportunity. Great. And here's how networking goes. Got my business cards, got my name tag. You sit in the car for 10 minutes to coach yourself up. So you have the guts to go in and talk to strangers. You go talk to strangers and it goes like this. What do you do? Okay. What do you do? Okay. We should have coffee, which you never do. And it never turns into a sale. And then you go back to that networking group. It's the same people that you don't want to meet. And it's a treadmill. There's nothing there. So that's the first way. And everyone's and the there s- to give a business card and get, but if everyone's there to, to give a business card and no one's there to buy, <laughs> right? Who, who goes to networking events and says, I wonder if I can meet 25 people to have programs, products, and services that I can buy. Yeah, nobody. Said nobody. Ever, nobody. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So you I'm just smiling back here because that's no, exactly right. That's, that's what it is, man. It is. That's so that's what one option. Then the other option, would this is the one you got to watch out for. So you meet somebody and it's a networking kind of conversation, but they think you're really smart and they think you're really onto something and they think you could really go places if you buy my coaching program. That's right. right. And they ask you for money. So if you're starting from zero, where can you go to have people around you that know the challenges you're facing, that are walking with you through that day-to-day grind of being a small business owner, but they're not trying to sell you something? So because the pandemic happened and we created that environment, the community launched. And now the Idea Collective community is about support. It's about positivity. It's about abundance. It's about learning what we don't know. It's about safety so you can ask questions in a genuine way and not worry about people judging you. And it's about networking and it's about getting coached. It's it's all of those things, but it would not have happened if we didn't organically build it on accident at the start of the pandemic. So you start building this thing. And I, I, I love how you're describing that because it's not that networking is bad or it's not that sales are bad or it's not that whatever it is. It's that whenever you focus in on one element, you're probably missing the other five, six elements of what a small business owner needs, especially a newer small business owner, which I, I really appreciate that about you. Um, so if you had a product, I mean, it's, it's community then. You're building, hey, come be part of this because is, is, is that the primary, like, how do I say this? The primary, not value, but the primary receiving for the people? Is it community first? Is it ideas first? Is it creativity? Is it new prospects and clients? If you had to prioritize, just for fun, a list of what you walk out of the Idea Collective with and what what needs were, are being fulfilled um, in order of like, hey, you probably get the most of this or this is your priority. And then secondary, you're going to get some of this. How, how would you list that more or less off the cuff? Unless you already top, have bullet points on your website. <laughs> no, I think the top priority and the biggest takeaway is that when you join, you find your people. And you earn a sense of belonging. You're no longer walking on your own. And that is the biggest deliverable. You walk into a group of people that want to see you succeed and you don't feel like you have to build it by yourself anymore. That's the first thing that you get when you join. 
beneath that, we've layered in all of the takeaways that you need to build your business. So we do brainstorming, we do education, we do night school, we do celebration events, we do, you know, all of these things on uh, financial flow and marketing and sales and operations. We do all that stuff. We do the annual retreat, but the top deliverable and the real I don't want to say innovation, but difference between us and other folks is it's almost an association or a fraternity. It's, it's a group of people that understand the small business owner's journey because it's unique. You can be a and solopreneur. If you're listening right now, let's say you have a husband or wife that works in corporate. They don't understand what you're doing. They don't empathize with what you're doing because they are not eating what they kill. They get a paycheck. If they get a paycheck, they don't understand what you're going through. You have to be surrounded by other people that are going through what you're going through to appreciate it. Mm. I love that you're no longer alone. And I think, I mean, you just, you nailed it. Nobody talks about that, really. You know, we talk about support and, you know, whatever. But the real thing, that's what it feels like when you're looking around in the basement or the proverbial basement, right? And you just go, man, do people at church get it? Does my mom and dad get it? Does my wife, my husband get it? Do my kids even get it? You know, my, my kid still doesn't know what I do. He just knows, oh, you're an entrepreneur. I said one day, I said that when he was 10, I said, what does that mean, Val? And he goes, well, you know, you do like podcasting and books and stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, I love you. That is, that's actually, I guess, what you see me do <laughs> the most. So now you are together. Go ahead. I was just going to say that as an entrepreneur, you can appreciate one of the true um, feelings that a solopreneur or a small business owner would have, which is at 11 o'clock, they make a big deal and they are the next Steve Jobs. And at three o'clock, something falls through and they are going to quit and go back to corporate. That can happen all in one day. <laughs> and when you don't have anyone around you, the emotional roller coaster is so sharp and the stakes are so high that I think many solopreneurs fail, not because they run out of ideas or even run out of money, they just run out of energy. It's just not worth it to do this anymore. I'll just go get a paycheck and go back to corporate and compromise my vision and build someone else's dream. And it's super defeating. That's the thing that keeps me going. That's what I love about what we're doing. And that's why I want people to get involved. Pat, is it when you have the right community, the right environment, incubator, all of that is you mentioned energy. Is it about like increasing the energy or is it about not letting the momentum get lost and deplete your energy? Like if I lose a sale, I, I completely relate to that. Somebody says no to me, I go, the world's ending, this is worthless. And then a big client says yes, and I go, that's why I do what I do. <laughs> Let me write 10 more books, right? Like it's, yeah. it's totally that. So I feel that energy, but I, I guess, yeah, what is it more about? It's about like increasing it? Is it about maintaining and getting rid of the highs and lows? Or is it about maybe a sounding board? When, hey, this high feels high, but it's not as high as you think. And this low feels low, but it's not as low as you think. Kind of talk me through what is that like? Because you've been in these phenomenal communities and incubating it, um, to use your word, for longer. What, what's that conversation like? And what's the energy, I guess, fix like? Yeah. I think solopreneurs know what they want to build. And they're driven, right? Driven entrepreneur. That's they're right. driven by a vision and a future they want to create. So I don't find that the highs need to be raised because people know when they're doing what they want and when they find success, it's a hell of a drug. But the lows, those are the ones that you want to have people around you for because you and I do similar enough things that if you were to call me and say, hey, this thing happened with the podcast or this thing happened with the event I was throwing, we share enough of what we do that there's an understanding that you can't get other places. And inside the community, if you have someone that you can call and say, I'm not crazy, am I? It's invaluable. It's invaluable. And it's not a coach that's paid to tell you you're not crazy. And it's not a networking person that doesn't really understand what you're doing. These are community members. These are people you've fought with, bled with, cried with, laughed with. These are your people, right? That is different. So there's this shared understanding that makes the lows not so low. They answer that question, I'm not crazy. And then when you have the high on the other side, your energy doesn't get raised when you share a high. 
but you don't forget it. We do a, an event in the group every Friday afternoon at four o'clock. We call the Friday finish line and we get people together. Now listen to this. We get people together Friday afternoon at four o'clock and it's our most popular show. You would think that's the time when no one wants to get on Zoom. It's our most popular show because here's how the show works. All right, Matt, what good happened to you this week? Whatever it is, you got a call back, you published a book, you did a great event and you say it and everyone cheers and it's not high-fiving your dog and people that know how hard it is to do an event, <laughs> like all of that stuff comes true. So the highs are made better, but the lows are the ones that I think we do the best job of helping people avoid. That's really good. I love that Friday at four, you'd think that's like the backyard barbecue. I don't, you know, the last thing I want to do is work, but right? you know, your people, Pat and entrepreneurs like at Friday at four, that's when we get started Saturday. I'm thinking about, you know, like there is no off switch. Speaking of off switches, do you find it useful and, or maybe you could speak to you, but also because again, you're such a great, um, community gatherer, you could speak to the general consensus of, of the community. Do you find it useful in the entrepreneur and solopreneur space to have that on off switch for work is done, it's five o'clock or seven or whatever time it is, or it's Saturday? Or do you find it's actually nicer to say you just kind of let it flow through the week and I end up having Wednesday morning at the beach and then I get back to work? Like, are you more of a flow calendar guy or are you more of a family time, work time kind of a guy? And what do you recommend for others? I don't think anyone should work 24 seven. I do not subscribe to the hustle and grind methodology. I do not subscribe to the 10 X rule or whatever hundred X rule or whatever it is. That's not how I flow. That's not what I believe in because I think people that don't do that right burn out and quit. So if people can manage that lifestyle, God bless, but that's not me. And it's not what I recommend. Here's what I recommend. I ask the folks in the community when this comes up to say, um, okay, what do you do? I write speeches for a living, let's say. So it's a creative kind of person. Okay. What time of day are yes. you at your most creative? Uh, in the mornings. Great. Go block out your calendar. Take no meetings in the morning, right? Give yourself every morning to do your most high leverage activity, no matter what it is. And then let everything else fall in around that. Oh, would you write better speeches if you walk to the beach every morning? Yeah. Okay. We'll put that on your calendar. Well, that's not walk, walk the beach in the morning, then right? get home, have a cup of coffee and write a speech. Yes. And it comes back to the idea of ask the boss for permission. And that's when they go, oh yeah, that's me, right? There is no construct that says we have to work Monday through Friday, eight to five or Monday through Saturday or Monday through Sunday. We get to pick just like we get to pick what we do for a living, just like we get to pick who we do it for, just like we get to pick what we talk about. We get to pick how we work. And I think a lot of people forget that. And it's so silly when you call it out. When you call it out, they're like, oh, yeah, of course I can do that. And it's really free. So I think people should build a calendar around what they do for a living and when their energy is right and then make everything else fit in. You know, there's other professions that do this fairly well. Like if you go see a chiropractor, pretty well established in that industry is you know they're going to be there Thursday afternoons only and Tuesday mornings only, and Wednesday morning, four-hour break, and then after work, Wednesday evening, kind of a thing, right? You know that they're blocked. And it feels like it makes sense somehow when I walk in there and I see their weird schedule and I go, oh, <laughs> it makes sense because, hey, you know, you don't have, you're starting and you kind of horseshoe all your clients into certain parameters. But somehow for me, I feel like well, I'm a coach and years ago, Pat, I don't know if you ever did this, but I know I did plenty of times. I don't do it today. I'm, I'm happy that I finally got something right. But years ago, I would always take the, you know, a client pays a bunch of money and I go, well, when do you want to do coaching? And then I have to fit them in to when it works for them. And, you know, what if I just said, I do coaching on Fridays because that's when I do coaching, by the way, on Fridays. And then I said, I have an 11 o'clock open and I have a four o'clock. Which one do you want? And I'm not even trying to sell them, you know, doing the whole double bind right? It's just, that's when I made available. And you know, what's funny. I've never once had a high end or even a, a mid end, whatever that is, client say, I can't do that. They, I have had them say, Oh, let me move a couple things around. Yeah. I could do four o'clock. So is there something, I don't know, like 
is there something in our minds that prevent us from thinking that we can actually choose? I run into it a lot that people feel like subconsciously maybe or emotionally, they can't really choose because they disappoint or a client would leave or I don't know what the fear is. What do you think about that? Do you think it's the fact that we are not satisfied with what enough looks like? That no matter how successful we are, we think we need more? Tell me more. Right? Like we could be hitting our goals, but we would never take next Tuesday off because Mm -hmm. maybe there's more or maybe I should be doing something else. Some folks in the community uh, joke about don't should all over yourself, right? So like whatever you should be doing, you get to determine. Um, So maybe it's just this expectation that we place on ourselves that we have to do more and we have to be more and we can't take time to rest or to get into the zones where we need to be to be good at what we do. There are responsibilities, especially if you're a coach or an author or a speaker. I fight feeling guilty about researching and reading and just being creative and having downtime to make new thoughts and new ideas. That makes me feel guilty for some reason, even though at the highest expression of what I'm doing for people, I am to be as sharp as I can be and all that stuff is the most valuable activity, but it still makes me feel guilty. Like I should be doing something else. Well, speaking of things you should be doing that you've set up for yourself, I know we have a retreat coming up uh, at the end of 2022, November. Um, I'm really interested and I'm one of the book speakers, which I'm incredibly uh, grateful for that opportunity. And I cannot wait uh, just to come and be with the people. And as you said, you know, be in person. When you thought about doing a live event for your idea collective community, there's a lot of ways to do live events, right? There's mastermind groups and there's seminars and conferences and all these things and there's retreats. What were some of the initial ideas that you got really excited about? Because I can tell when I talked to you about it from day one, you were not like, well, this is my revenue generator or this is, you know, like this is the lead magnet that goes to the say. You were just like, man, I want to do this awesome retreat for my people and you start to envision it, what are some of the things you're most excited about the way you're approaching this live retreat coming up in November? It started with my wife and I. She owns a small business. I own a small business. And for years, we would do an annual retreat, just her and me, in December. And we'd take two days. We'd spend a day planning her business, a day planning my business, and then we'd go on into the next calendar year. And as we told people about it, they wanted to do that too. So when I started the community, I thought, okay, this opportunity to step away from the day-to-day operations of a small business is really never afforded to a solopreneur. If you're a fat cat CEO, you get to fly to Palm Springs and stare at the clouds and think about your business. If you're a solopreneur, when do you allow yourself to stop, reflect, reset, daydream, plan for the next year? It doesn't happen. It's, It's just not there. That's it. That was the motivation behind it. So three days, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, early November, killer speakers, including you, right? And it's a chance to get fired up, meet the other people in the community, and get ready for the next year that's coming. What are the biggest takeaways that um, you're hoping and planning for and praying that people will take away from the time at the retreat? We chunk it out into different sections. Thursday is about networking and learning, tactical stuff we can use. Friday is about being inspired about what's coming next. We are bringing in Mike Michalowicz, the author of Profit First, to do on-site or at least virtual, but individual coaching for our members. People are going to get a chance to ask him for business advice, which is really compelling for everybody in the room. And then Saturday is about goal setting. So learn something you don't know get inspired on Friday, and then on Saturday, make those tangible goals that you want to achieve in the coming year. So I want it to be one weekend for you to get reconnected with the community and to think about uh, what you want the next year to be for your business. Very exciting. And I'll tell you, um, guys, I've talked about Mike McCallowitz before. Profit First changed my life, changed my business. And he's got some phenomenal, phenomenal books and teaching. So the fact that you have someone of that caliber and, you know, the caliber of you as well, man, you, you're you just an unbelievable supporter, an unbelievable creative guy. I really love being around you, Pat. You're awesome. Um, where can people find out more about the Idea Collective, the retreat, just all things Pat Miller and all things solopreneur support? I appreciate the opportunity to share. 
The retreat is at smallbizretreat.com, smallbizretreat.com. And the uh, Idea Collective is all summarized on our website, ideacollectiveincubator.com, ideacollectiveincubator.com. And then you also have, uh, this, this is what I find really cool too. You have a Facebook group and uh, yeah, you have a Facebook group, the, the Idea Collective Small Business Incubator, and that's free to join, I believe. So you can actually go can basically be around the community to, you know, to the level you can in the Facebook group, but you guys really go deep and you really connect and there's a lot going on in there. Um, so where can they grab that? And then is there anything else that you want to share about where to get started with all things, again, incubator and, and business? The Facebook group's a way we can start the conversation. So it's the Idea Collective Small Business Incubator Facebook group. And then starting the conversation with me. Like if you're in that situation where you just want to have someone walking with you that understands your journey, let's book them one-on-one. I'd love to hear about what you're doing and I'd love to hear about where you're trying to take it because what we say in the community, and this is our tagline, it's your dream, don't grow it alone. That's why we're here. So I'd love to have a conversation if you're feeling that way. Nothing could be said better than that. It's your idea. Don't grow it alone. Pat Miller, you're awesome. Hey, if you're listening on air, of course, we're going to put all of Pat's links in the show notes on the podcast. So make sure you find The Driven Entrepreneur online. You can get it at mattbrownypodcast.com uh, or wherever you get your podcast. You can get that and all 300 plus episodes are all completely available. No paywall, always free for you with a phenomenal guest, just like Mr. Pat Miller. Pat, thank you so much for coming on. You are a legend. Thank you, sir. (laughs) Thanks for having me, Matt. I appreciate it. All right, guys, that's the show this week. Thanks for listening. As always, I so appreciate you. Um, As I've said before, without you, I would just be a crazy person speaking in a room by myself, and that doesn't really change the world. So it's you that's changing the world. Thank you so much. Get out there this weekend. Connect with Pat Miller, the Idea Collective. And of course, as always, stay driven. Bye-bye. Hey, this episode is brought to you by my very own NLP practitioner course. I've been teaching Neuro Linguistic Programming, or NLP, for nearly 15 years. It is the most powerful tool for communication on the planet, and it can be yours today. For a very limited time, I'm giving away my entire NLP course workbook for free. Go to nlpwithmatt.com. All the patterns, all the tools, and the techniques of NLP in the complete course workbook, the same one that we use to teach our live certification classes, yours free. NLPwithmatt.com. Get it today. Let's get back to the show.